Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening to another episode of The Creative Truth. Today, I'm sitting down with an old friend of mine, Bruce Alwan Pandolfo, and he is a poet, a musician, a writer. Uh, we go back to the old Oswego days in upstate New York. And uh, I guess to kick it off, you want to just tell everyone about yourself? Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, my name is Bruce. Uh, I go primarily by all one um, in my creative endeavors, but am I cutting out a lot? There's a little bit of a skip. I don't know if that's like a connection issue. <laughs> um, I'm technologically inept, clearly. <laughs> uh, no, um, but yeah, so primarily what I do is I make music um, in the rap vein, but I also sing, uh, I write poetry um, and perform that. And uh yeah, that's that's kind of my jam mostly, and then and that takes up most of my time when I'm when I'm doing well. <laughs> and uh, yeah, yeah, I've done a lot of music over the last ten years, crazily. Um, to I just started just around before when Tyler and I met, about maybe two thousand June two thousand ten. I released my first album, and I've been doing it all independently since. Do you have a way to quantify how much you've put out there? Do you do you count it by like the number of albums or tracks or? Um, yeah, if I go by, I think I was peaking. Was why it was kind of. Oh, out. could be. I just, I just uh, adjusted the gain on the cool. mic, so that should cool, work. Cool. Um, yeah, if I, so I think it's uh, last count. I think it's like eight, eight albums maybe. Uh, three, two EPs. No, f five EPs <laughs> all together. That's a big different, a very different number. And uh, four or five LPs. Maybe it's closer to 10. I I've never know. understood. What's the difference between an EP and an LP? Uh, well, in the digital age, it's kind of irrelevant, but yeah. it goes back to uh, vinyl and uh, LP was long play and EP was extended play. Uh, and extended play is like, so it's shorter. So you would have like, I don't know what it, I think it's like maybe somewhere between like, I'm going to sound really ignorant right now to people who are in the know, but uh, I guess that's always the case. Uh, I think it's like under typically they'd be like four to six tracks because the, the album, the EP record itself was smaller. So you'd get like two or three tracks on each side. Hmm. And LP was like for the long, like what we think of as like a normal album. Yeah. 33 and a third. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> so that those that uh it's like anachronistic but like that that terminology has stuck around even though like it doesn't matter at all in the in the digital age <laughs> and extended play is the shorter of the two yeah yeah extended beyond being like a 7 inch single i guess okay so yeah but no I, one no one no one puts out a single and they're like yeah i just put out my 7 inch uh -huh. <laughs> unless they have an only fan <laughs> Singles only. <laughs> so, so, um, yeah. That's so you've been at it music. like, it's a you, lot of music. Overlap. You've been at it a decade. So like, what was the, what was the first thing that piqued your interest? Maybe people that inspired you. Um, mm -hmm. and then, uh, how did you kind of carve out what became is now kind of like your path? And I've, I've been fortunate enough to kind of see your growth and change through the years. Yeah. So. Um, I'm glad you think that that's a fortunate circumstance. Um, uh. I, so, <laughs> so I would say I was always inclined towards writing and things with words um, since I was a kid. And then about uh, probably around 10th grade or so in high school, um, I discovered a, a more matured, interest in writing and poetry because of the poetry unit in school. Uh, and I, I really took a liking to that. And then around that time also, I discovered a couple of uh, hip hop artists that really resonated with me from sort of the underground and more niche and sort of creative, lyrical, poetic vein of, of hip hop. Um, so people like uh, Sage Francis, who his music single-handedly like got me writing and whatnot in that st style, as well as P. 
people like Atmosphere, who are pretty well known by now, um, Idea and Abilities, uh, and eventually that developed into more of a love of hip hop. Um, and my dad's a musician, so that was kind of always around. He, he plays guitar and sings and stuff. So that was always around me. And uh, yeah, I just, I always wrote. And then it became a daily habit. And then eventually I was going out to open mics uh, obsessively, uh, you know, and I kind of had a second home at the local cafes. And once that was happening, uh, I started collaborating with fellow performers and musicians, mostly musicians. And, uh, and that's when I decided to try to record music. And the resultant first album uh, that I released in June 2010, um, Collaborations, is like eight tracks. And they're all live music uh, with local Long Island musicians of various genres and approaches to music. I have it here somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, from there, it just kind of blossomed into more and more experiments. And I kind of, for m the majority of my music now is like overproduced beats, not so much with live music. Um, although I do a lot of performing with musicians and I love that. And um, I've always just found it since then, I've just found working with production um, to be more, I guess, reliable in a way. And it's easier, you know, I can just kind of get beats and do things on my own time and not have to call anybody in. And it kind of came out of necessity. Um, I had a, a live band, uh, All One in the Room. We put out two albums together in 2011 and 2012. Um, and that was really fun. And I worked with a lot of other musicians, but the hassle in the first few albums I made of putting everyone together in a room and getting everyone to practice and rehearse and perform. Eventually I decided I wanted to work at a faster pace and rapping and writing over production by, you know, beat makers and stuff kind of became a thing. And that's also a little bit more conventional. And I think I found myself wanting to try that route and go that direction as well, just to kind of be like, you know, I can't, I, I could do more than just the, be weird and kind of rappy over acoustic guitars and blues and, and folk and weird guitar loops and stuff like that. Like I can rap on beats and, and find my, my way through that landscape as well. And, uh, you know, I don't know. I just kept making things and keep meeting people. And when I get excited to meet new people, I collaborate with them and projects result. And, uh, you know, it's, it's been a really cool journey and, I find myself insatiable still and constantly coming up with ideas on a daily basis and have a, a hopper full of concepts and projects that are, you know, <laughs> unfinished and uh, always looking to, to be done. So that creative drive and hunger and inspiration hasn't s stopped at all. <laughs> so uh, for some context for you, this show is about basically discovering the path people took and inspiring younger people who are, who mm -hmm. want to pursue these kind of careers yeah. to, you know, how, how do you become successful? How do you survive? So one question I I'm interested in is currently now that you've been at it for a while and there's no, there's no right answer, wrong answer, anything. How are you making the majority of your livable income to like pay rent and pay the utilities? Um, definitely from your average jobs. Currently I do, I uh, do a lot of gig work the last couple of months with Grubhub. Um, and then I also work for a local company called economic opportunity council. And essentially I'm like a one-on-one -on -one community habilitation person for someone with autism. Who's like a, a family member of a friend's, uh, family, um, long time family friend. So um, I would say my relationship to work has always been, or my relationship to work that isn't my own has always been contentious. And it's always felt like, you know, I could work a full day on someone else's time and feel like my day starts when I get home, even if it was like a 14 hour day, you know, like that's even, I mean, if I'm exhausted, it's not to say like suddenly I, I'm renewed with the energy of <laughs> someone who didn't just work a long shift. 
but I always kind of compartmentalized my my identity and my time, I think, as someone who like exists only when I'm dictating what I do. So the through line eventually with a lot of my work, like right now I make my own schedule. For 10 years, I just got furloughed from a job um, and laid off eventually uh, that I had for like nine years um, with another company working with the developmentally disabled. But, um, you know, I kept that job for a long time primarily because it afforded me the time to work on my craft and to do my, my work, you know. Um, and I didn't move up in that company, although I was, you know, well liked and I did my job well. And, um, I consistently chose to remain at a certain spot because I didn't want more responsibility. I, I kept choosing flexibility, um, over everything, almost everything else, because I wanted the opportunity. They would, they would pay, I would get paid leave to go for like an extended leave of absence and go on like a three week tour. Um, and I'd be like, Hey, I'm taking my holiday time. I need to go. And then I would go for, you know, three to five weeks. And, you know, that was kind of an irreplaceable gift. Right. So I could have made more money. I could have moved up. I could have got, had a better quote unquote resume in that field. But, you know, I made intentional choices not to do that because it, I valued my time outside of that job more. <clears throat> So I think that I think that really resonates with will resonate with a lot of creative people because the people that seem to be successful or at least should be successful are the ones that are doing it for their own love of the craft and love of their medium and a love of whatever they're creating and not for success because it is so difficult to become like you know a pop star like you, a lot right. of people go to Nashville and they expect to do some open mics and then get discovered by EMI or whatever. And then they're sure. like Taylor Swift. And <laughs> and if you actually go to Nashville, like every performer Everyone is, thinks that, right? Yeah. And but they're all amazing. Level. And right. Never yeah, even the, yeah. The ecosystem of talent is different. The level, the, the bar is set so much higher and gifted. I mean, I know this about Long Island as well. There's there, I could name almost probably two dozen people who are talented enough and driven enough that they should be, you know, millionaires, right? And they should be known among thousands and hundreds of thousands of people. And they aren't because of just certain things, whether, you know, it could be any slew of things. We can go into that later. But yeah, it's a totally different thing. Um, absolutely. And I but guess... You, but you don't stop. You, you don't stop. You no, just No. Keep... Yeah, no. And I think uh, this is something I kind of tell people a lot, which is like, if you want to get into music or art uh, because you want fame and money, you know, just, just don't, if, if that's the, <laughs> just, just get a trade, just yeah. work as a, a well, an arc welder or a plumber or something like you're going to make more money over time. Statistically chances are doing that stuff. And I, I don't say and not work as hard. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, or or work hard in a different way, but yeah. not work so defeatedly, you know, <laughs> not work in vain so many days in a row, maybe, um, right? And and that's not to discourage people. Don't get me wrong. It's it's the the key there is the motivation, right? Like you're saying, is if you don't love the intrinsic, there's a weird paradox. Like the the chances are you'll have a more successful career if you would do what you do regardless of your degree of success. If you were not going to make money, but you would still put in hours a week and hours a week making what you make or, or doing what you love and maybe sharing it, then, <clears throat> then chances are you're going to put the work in, you know, um, which is not to say that your passion is the key to your success because it's definitely not. <laughs> uh, that's not the only thing, but you definitely need that. And if you don't have that, it will show in your music. If you don't have that, you will burn out very quickly and you'll, you know, the, the path that is difficult, you won't be able to endure it um, because you don't have that, the fire underneath you and, and within you to persist through the difficulties. Um, you won't have the belief in your work after you get rejected for the umpteenth time. Um, 
And so, yeah, I think, I think like you're saying, the, the passion, the innate value of the work needs to be there in order for you to actually, you know, do this long haul of a journey. <laughs> it's not, it's, it's a, what is the term? It's like a, it's a marathon, not a sprint, you know? You know what I think about too, like in the same um, thought is so many, for me, I'm not as focused in, in one medium so much because now all of a sudden I'm a podcaster, right? But, uh, but um, I'm, I'm into photography and video and some days I paint and some days I try and write, you know, whatever. I'm just doing different things. But mm -hmm. when I look around at people, I get, I don't know, kind of like annoyed or I don't really understand how people are just consumers. Like they, cons mm. they consume they, they, and there's nothing like, it's okay. I watch TV, you know, I read books and stuff, but they're consuming, consuming, consuming. But then like, I'm compelled to then create and take, you know, everything I've ever learned and pass it through the Tyler filter and then mm -hmm. create something from that. And then the, the cool part for me is, and I don't know if it has to do with my desire to like leave a legacy or, or just like, I don't know, I'm not sure why, but like I have to put something out into the universe. And then once it exists, it's there kind of forever. And like when you've written a track and you publish a track, yeah. it's, it's like a bench. It's kind of where you were in your life at that time. Even if it's simple, as just a photograph. It's you're creating something that didn't exist prior to you being there. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's a really great point about the consumer, but like <clears throat> for some people that's where the buck stops, you know, um, or where the experience stops. Um, but for me, <clears throat> watching things and reading things um, becomes something else and it gets amalgamated into, you know, where I like alchemize it through my creative process into another thing. And then, yeah, like you're saying, that's a way, often it's an opportunity to, I mean, A, just distract ourselves with the exciting and gratifying experience of creating, which I think some people have it and just some people simply don't, you know. My mom, <clears throat> she's more of like an engineer brain type of person. Um, <clears throat> is that left brain? I believe like so. More, more mechanical, sort of uh, rational type. So she doesn't have like a creative bone in her body. Uh, my dad has a bit of that. That's where I think that's where I get that from. There, there is a lot of creative creativity on both sides, but, but for my mom, like she is not a person who would put music on in the car. Like she has no impetus to do these things. Like the, the connecting, uh, there's certain things that just don't happen for some people. They don't connect. They don't make connections. They don't see things. They see things at face value, not in potentials that then get fused into other things. And, uh, and I think like you're saying, it's, it's a legacy thing for sure. You know, wanting to, I always say like, it's kind of self-deprecating, but it's like justifying the space that I take up to mm. be in service of other people and mm -hmm. to, to, you know, prove like, yeah, there was a reason I was here. I mean, I'm not a scientist. I'm not, but I can maybe entertain, maybe I can, you know, like what I've been doing with the typewritten commission poems lately um, is like take people's experiences and turn them into something and gift that into an artifact of some kind, whether that's a song or a poem or a short story or um, some, some kind of performance of some kind. Um, elaborate, on, elaborate on that a little bit. What, what is that commission poems? Oh yeah. Yeah. So <clears throat> I was gifted a few months ago. Uh, my grandma gave me a 1960s uh, typewriter and um, I just started, playing around with it and I had seen some I had seen that people you know will do busking on the street corners and stuff writing poems for people um and I thought well that might be kind of fun to do and there's something kind of fascinating about the typewriter that it makes a one of a kind like right then and there it makes a a one of one unique artifact and uh so I just started putting it out there that I would write poems for people um since I can't really go out and do this on the street. Uh, I just started doing it online. And then the past few months I've been doing, you know, I've probably done about two dozen or so. Um, just kind of 
allowing people to write through me basically with whatever is on their mind emotionally or whatever they've been mulling over intellectually or some, some of them have been gifts to other people um, on behalf of the person that comes to me. And, and I just kind of am the conduit or the filter through which these feelings pass. And then I create like a, I type up a poem and I give it to them. And that's the only one that exists of that. And that's been a really beautiful sort of instant gratification experience. And in these specifically in these pandemic times, it's been almost like a performance, which I've sorely missed. I, I live for the, for performing and I love the stage so much and I feel so comfortable there and I love the interactive aspect of it. And there's an improvisational aspect to the typewriter experience as you're typing the, the piece up. Um, and so that's kind of sating all of those uh, things that I enjoy about making and about performing. Um, so that's been like a recent venture that's brought in a fair amount of uh, money, which is nice and it's been supporting me and people have been um, really supportive in that way and connecting with me in that way. And uh, they've been responsive. I think people have really enjoyed the work and, and whatnot. So, you know, I guess my point with all of that though, and, and what I feel best about is using what I do as a way to change people's life or experience or represent something for them in a way or help them process something or help them communicate to their whatever it is, their spouse or their child or their friend or just themselves. Um, and if I can do that with my work, then, you know, that makes me feel really good. And it makes me feel like there's a point to what I do. It's not just being like a, a lofty sort of, you know, out of time person who just has these like skills, you know, like back in the day, I, I recently took a class. I've been in school the past few months, uh, the past year or so actually, mm -hmm. but I, I took an art as history class and that actually like changed my perspective about a lot because it was essentially about the process of um, art as labor <clears throat> and how that's eventually dissolved away. But, you know, in, in the 1800s, and the, you know, even before that, you know, bards and artists of all kinds and, uh, you know, um, people who made lithographs and, and all these things, basically artists were just other forms of laborers. And, you know, we don't think of that anymore. Everyone's no, we're, we're non-essential. Everyone's, yeah. yeah. And everyone's a quote unquote content creator and, and, and everyone sque I'm certainly squeamish. I can at least speak for myself about making money and about treating it as a business. And yeah. I know the majority of people, there's almost zero connection between being a business person and being an artist. And there's something, you know, I think we've been conditioned over, over decades of, of cultural, uh, cultural, um, I don't know, perspectives or discourse. Um, there has been like a paradigm that's changed over time, but essentially we think of, Mutual, we think of business and art as mutually exclusive and almost corrupting, right? Um, in the class, we learned this idea or they, they talked about the idea of the aestheticism movement, which is, you know, like art for art's sake as being the privileged class of people who created this conversation around ma making art, uh, which should not be considered a a labor like a work of labor and if you were making art in a way that was um commercial in any sense then that was somehow corrupting art and you know uh the only the only way you could say that is if you didn't have to make money <laughs> while you were making your art right <laughs> like uh you know the, the someone who's complaining that someone's making money on their art is someone who like has never had to try to pay the bills with their skill set. You know, it's, it's I, almost kind of the natural progression of most artists as they go to become more mainstream too. You know, it's like everyone likes the, yeah. the early albums and then they're like, Oh, they they went too pop or they changed or whatever. Right. Be and then it could be because they've made like their celebrities and they've made so much money that they're out of touch with what it means to be like heartbroken or, you know, living paycheck to paycheck or whatever. And they're just out of yeah. touch with the, the, I don't know. I'm not, or it could just be that 
people, like you said, just re- reject it once they've reached a certain level of success mm. and they're like, oh, they're too, they're too mainstream yeah. or whatever. I think both of those things are true. And I also think there's an aspect where <clears throat> there's a very specific like art by committee, like, uh, you know, the, the, the music business is a music business, right? So they think of profit terms and they think of, this is not to be like, oh, music business, man, it ruins the art. Like it's just factually when you consider it, like most labels, most like everything is a product, like an album is a product and you're only going to, so you want to optimize the album, which at one time was a literal record and, you know, in multiple senses of the term of like a human experience and a soul and, (laughs) and, um, communicating something through music and through lyric and, and performance, you know, now what supersedes that is profitability. So you want to like pop music feels watered down because it's art by committee. It's because it like assimilates into, it's why like everything at this point where at the time of us speaking, everything's turned into like an EDM slash country song (laughs) because those things are popular and (laughs) so every artist is like all right you know so and so we need you to make the edm pop country rap song or whatever uh those are the top things right now and so let's shoehorn whatever you do into that and then we can do the pr for that so it's like people become products and art becomes a product and you know that's when you get swallowed up into that contractually and when you get swallowed up into that as a lifestyle, you know, you kind of become obligated in some sense and, you know, you do lose a little of yourself and that's not to be, that's not like anti mainstream music or anything, but I I do feel that like, that's just a fact of that realm of, or that level of, of making music, you know, um, it's very rare. I mean, I think it's now more possible than ever given the internet, but I think it's pretty rare for someone to do their really weird niche genius thing that is only their own world whenever they want, whatever they want and to be hyper successful, you know, like the thing is, is there's certainly an audience for that work, but like finding the audience takes something and, you know, the, if you, you can always find what that audience is, but it's really difficult to do so. And like all of the powers that be that, you know, have the radio, you know, bought out or whatever it is, which is not a conspiracy. That's just like factual and that's fine. You know, I mean, we all have the internet, right? So we can put our shit on Spotify and all these other channels. Um, not that they pay much, but that's, that's another conversation. Um, but you can do all that stuff. So it's more egalitarian now. Mm-hmm. Um, but now, like you said, everything's become like the internet has become the, the move to Nashville that you described earlier, because right. now, now you exist in the same environment as every most, every talented person that everyone knows in their local town and their city. <laughs> like, <laughs> all of those people are now the ecosystem of the internet. And the quarantine has really exacerbated that because now yeah. everyone's home. So everyone's producing from yes. their, their bedroom. Yeah. 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 And yeah. And that's the other thing is like, you don't, there's not, there's so many, so fewer obstacles between someone thinking up something and actually sharing it with the world recording. I mean, this is why you have the cliche of SoundCloud rappers or whatever is like, you know, anyone can like, record a song you can make your one track away yeah you can produce a beat you can record you can like mix all that you can do on an iphone you can shoot a video on an iphone you can edit the video on the iphone and you can put that up on like however many social media things you want so i think we're like in this this bizarro almost like paradise of creativity but it's also like so oversaturated that it's hard to wade through all the white noise um, and also, you know, we're, we're in a time where we worship, uh, we worship quantity over quality and we worship, uh, that's the product uh, thing you're talking yes, about. Mm-hmm. Yes. And urgency has overcome or urgency and virality has overcome, um, longevity and enduring, uh, quality. Right. So that's why someone like Kendrick Lamar, I think has been so successful and exceptional, because he's like an artist's artist and 
you know, isn't just doing singles. He's doing like broad, complicated, complex albums and concept albums and things like that in a time when in like rap mainstream wise, especially like there's very few people doing things like that. So it's like, whoa, this is like the artist's artist, you know, this guy's writing so many things, the human condition, such a broad. So, you know, those people are a dime a dozen if you're looking in the right circles, but they're very rarely getting the spotlight. You know what I mean? And uh, so it's, it's extra exceptional when you see that, that genius come to life. Do you indulge in, in mindless uh, pop or uh, mainstream content that you're just like, you know what? I know there's nine writers on this garbage track, but I can't help it. It's catchy. Like I'm uh, going to listen to it. Not so much. I don't, I mean, probably not. If anything more so in <clears throat> like scrolling like Instagram oh, or, sure. or like sometimes I'll watch a stupid show on Netflix, but less so with music. I mean, mostly what I listen to with music is like local people that I know some like underground holdovers from, from earlier in my life that I still, that still like make things that are great. And then mostly I just go down rabbit holes of, of people um, like I've been on a Van Morrison kick lately. Mm. Um, I, t- I love Tom Waits. I, I get into mm-hmm. a lot of that and uh, a lot of like blues stuff and jazz stuff. Like, a, uh, and, and I kind of, I'm still kind of old fashioned. So I go to the library and I get CDs and I upload them to my computer. <laughs> and then I, I, I like, I mean, I have like a, a Bluetooth thing in my car. So, or not, uh, yeah, I have that. But then I also have a USB drive. And I'll like make a whole set of folders on a USB drive and I put that in my car. So I like don't really use Spotify or Pandora or anything like that. <laughs> um, so I'm a little behind in that way. Well, they all end up pushing the same tracks anyway. Like even if you enter an artist, they only play the most popular tracks yeah, by yeah. that artist. So you don't, you don't, right. it's hard. In the old days of Pandora, I feel like I used to discover a lot of new, new artists from Pandora, but not so much anymore. Yeah, uh, my roommate has said it, it t- definitely has taken him a, con- a concerted effort to continue to discover things these days through mm-hmm. streaming sites as a because the white again, noise. Yes, exactly. And like, oh, well, we'll push all of the most popular things. Uh, and that's just kind of like how the algorithms play out and stuff, right? Uh, what's that movie where uh, that the obey, consume? Uh, it's aliens came to earth and the guy has special glasses. Yo, I can't <laughs> believe you're saying this right now. I literally thought about this this morning and I was going to search online and I did one of those mental moments where I was like, what am I going to Google? Like movie where guy sees advertising aliens. Like, I think it's called like they're I, alive or something. I, they live, no, they live. Oh, it's called- oh. Okay. Oh yeah, with uh, Roddy, Rowdy Roddy Piper. Yeah, yeah. I came I here thought, to kick some ass and chew bubble gum, but I'm all no, out of bubble gum. <laughs> I thought, okay, that's crazy. I was, I didn't think you were talking about that. I there's another movie. I think it's called Branded, but I'm not oh. sure. But it's a similar concept. Okay. And the guy essentially, it's it's a yeah. I didn't even realize that that's what they live is entirely about but it's essentially the exact same idea but a guy keeps seeing these like horrific creatures and monsters but they're all made up of um like billboards and advertisement like you know like a coca-cola billboard fused with a pepsi billboard fused with like a verizon sign and whatever and they like chase after him and stuff and he realizes like he's one of the only people that can see it and what you kind of find out is there's like this uh, all of the top executives and people in the world have signed over the rights to the consciousness or the subconsciousness of humanity to these like interdimensional influential beings. And they use corporate advertising as the means by which to uh, like be the interlopers of your consciousness, I guess. And hmm. I, it's it's some like random sort of B movie kind of thing. Like I feel like it's something I saw at a red box in like 2009. And I was like, wait, what? This is something? <laughs> okay, I guess I'll give this a shot. But uh, yeah, I have to look that up. But that's crazy that you said that. That really blew my mind. But yeah, They Live is, is an, uh, is it? They Live? Yeah. Yeah, with I the glasses so. and like the weird like blue skull uh-huh. alien people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yep. you're right. You're right. But yeah, that's that's definitely the case. I mean, 
when you step out for a while, like I think probably a lot of people can have this now, but because of streaming sites, but if you only watch television or, or video via streaming, and then you, let's say probably go home or go to your grandparents or something, you watch cable. It is the most disturbing out of body, like weird out of body experience to see commercials. I mean, we're inundated with them all the time. And it's like but two like, minutes long every five minutes. Yeah. And you real, and I don't know when I, when you step back a second and like, don't take for granted what your experience, you know, like, and you, you really look at like what commercials are saying and doing about just like things that on a day-to-day basis, you just don't need, you know, or like even the way that people sell things to you, uh, like using, using terms uh, that have to do with like your emotional well being, but it's like a a Coca-Cola. That's a drink that you would never in your life need to drink. (laughs) Like it's so strange. It's really bizarre. And like, or just food that no one should ever want like a a Burger King or whatever. And like, if you step back a second and like, let's not, let's be real. I'm not like living in the woods. Like I'm very, right. We're not, neither of us are anti-material or whatever. Yeah, you yeah, know? yeah. I mean, like I'm probably more on that, like more to the anti-material than the average person for sure. But like, I'm very entrenched in, in a lot of material things, I, I suppose. But you know, just uh, when you step back from that, it's so pervasive and it's, so intense and it's it's like obnoxious <laughs> and and when you if you do the experiment of like i'm not going to buy anything except essentials or just nothing for like a week you you'll feel the invasiveness of all of the things vying for your attention and for your money and for you know like it's the same thing with if you were to do like a no phone day just for like 24 hours no phone you know you you feel the the phantom vibrations in your pocket you feel the impulse how many times you go to like touch your phone for no reason at all <laughs> um it's it's wild it's it's really wild but where were we we got off topic and we became these <laughs> we became like mr robot <laughs> well <laughs> i i did you i don't know if you used the word fear but you said mm. something along the lines of like you're you are worried that you're, you're worried about the business. I don't know if, if you use the word worry, fear, but you mentioned like the business side of what you do oh, and yeah. that do you think you're actually afraid of, of what we were talking about earlier and that losing some of your creative ability or influence or motivation by becoming too quote unquote successful, even though like I would argue that you're one of the, like you and I are both very successful because we wake up, you know, in the morning and we get to create. So, mm. but you know what I'm saying? Like mainstream su- type success. You think you, is that a fear of yours? Like if you, <clears throat> if you reach, if you get too far, you'll actually lose some of that ability. Uh, yeah. I mean, just in the theory I, or idea of what I, how much creative control would I give up? My stubborn answer is, is z- almost zero, you know, like, so that I have that wall up for me. You know, so you'll um, take you'll take um, creative control over like success. You would turn down like a big contract if they wanted creative control type thing. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think I think within reason because that's a very slippery slope. And I mean, for me personally, I mean, it's a hard it's a hard sell, right? There's a lot of thing. There's a lot to be talked about with that. Um, what is it that you want? You know, like for some people, if you could make more money than you'd ever make in your lifetime in if you just sign up for like a soul destroying five year contract or whatever and let's be real this is still making music right so it's still what you want but to me i don't know there's something there's something about corrupting maybe i'm being too mystical about it or i'm being too romantic and and passionate in like a childish and not pragmatic way but there's something disturbing to me about co- compromising and corrupting your relationship to your craft so much more than if you were to just spend more of your time doing like a menial job or a, a, a labor job. Because like, I think I would rather, I think I would rather do like a labor job 
but make the art that I need to, I feel that I need to make unbridled or un, un influenced by someone else who has no interest in what my direct experience is or what my intention in interacting with my audience is uh, because they're more interested in like how I can be leveraged or how my, my gifts can be leveraged into money. And let's be honest, I would be the benefactor or I would be the beneficiary of some of that money. And I, you know, and I would be making money, but I don't know. I'm, it's hard. I think you, it's inevitable that you would grow to some level of resentment towards your own craft and to, towards your, your relationship. I've seen it. I've seen it with some people. I know, you know, I have some friends of friends who are like very successful artists that are like in the music industry who like write song, who they write hits for, you know, the hits you hear on the radio and, you know, their solo music gets shelved. They write entire records that they're proud of. And those belong to the, to the record company and the record company says, well, I don't know. I, we don't think that that's the right thing. And then they just cannot share that music with the world f- indefinitely or for 10 years. And to think of that situation to me, I, I think I would choke someone to death. <laughs> I, I think I would, I think I would break contract. However, I think like very quickly, but I, you know, that's just my, my stubborn romantic relationship to what I do. I, I treat it, I think of it as a religion. I think of creating and, and the individualized aspect of that. And I think of the uniqueness of, of art and the sincerity of it as, I think that's magic to me. I think that that's, that's like God to me, you know? I, I, so to, to allow that to be pillaged for some weird material thing by someone who does not care unless I can be commodified, that feels wrong to me in a way that gets like under my skin in a creepy way. Um, so yeah, I, I think there's a certain ceiling that I've set for myself that like, I think as an individual, as a, as an independent artist, you can certainly be successful and you don't, and you can, and by that, I mean, you can make a living doing what you do through varying, like what you're saying w- with what you do. It's like, through like a multifaceted, multi-genre, you know, variety of skills that you do with your heart and your abilities, whether it be video or photo or music or or writing and so on, which is like what I'm trying to do. Like whatever it is, like I will try to make money. Like I'm making a fair amount of money right now, more more in the last four months than I have with music in the last two years doing these typewritten poems. Now, that doesn't feel to me like corrupting my art or my music because it's the thing I'm choosing to do and I do it on my terms and interact directly with people and am doing something pure through my craft and through these people, right? Like, so that's like still me doing my thing, even if it's not me making a record that's equally making as much money. So like that's in some sense, it's a business decision right, right now. But, you know, um, but I've been able to make that choice and I've been able to use my skills in a way that I've figured out how to, I guess, market them or, you know, support myself right now through people's interest in this particular lane of what I'm doing. Um, And I'll probably double down and choose to do this more because like I see that it can support me and I see that I can support my music and whatnot. And maybe my bread and butter will be that, you know, or, you know, right now I'm going to school for journalism. Um, journalism is interesting to me for a number of reasons, but one of the motivations for that is because it's writing, it's telling stories, it's learning all the time, it's challenging myself with deadlines, it's potentially it's travel and it's meeting people and telling stories and learning more about humanity, all of which are things that characterize my musical endeavors as well, you know, and my relationship to music and why I do it. So those are the lifestyles and choices that I think of and that I've chosen to make. Um, But again, it's, it's using the skills that are important to me. It's using, you know, I'm not an, a, a contractor. I'm not, good you know i i know you know a lot about fixing houses by now but like i don't do those things but my trade is 
the writing, it's the recording, it's the musicality of things. It's the, you know, being able to synthesize other people, my empathy with people into art in some way. So these are things that I need to figure out how to support myself through and impact other people's lives and hopefully like make some decent legacy like we talked about. Right. So, so those are the things that I think of um, when it comes to like the choices I make, but when it comes to like the music stuff, I've certainly like have a set of ethics that like will bar me from certain, you know, altitudes of success or financial income or whatever that is. Um, but, you know, you don't need to be selling a million albums or making millions of dollars to be a successful musician. And on the independent tip, you maybe only need to, if you make 40,000 a year in a lot of States, you can, you might be able to live off of that. If you can do that with your music or whatever, even if you have to make, like do a little job on the side, I'd say you're a successful musician. You know, I'd say you're a successful artist. If That's you can crazy. wake up in the morning and, and, and set spend your own schedule. Your and, yeah. 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 I mean, to me, it's like, if you can be your own boss, that's important. That's huge. Right. I mean, you know, you're entering into, you're a fledgling entrepreneur. Three days, four days in, fourth day four. <laughs> Amazing. And you haven't fired yourself yet. <laughs> that's good. No, I feel, and I feel more alive than I've ever felt. And the other thing I was thinking about is for, for younger people, I definitely went through a long period of not really knowing who I am and what those uh, integrities are and, you know, the value system of, of my work. And then because of that, I kind of was counting on what other people thought. And at times I sacrificed my own integrity and I did things I, that made me not feel good. And because like, you're, I'm sure you're familiar with the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Yeah. Hierarchy of needs. We gotta pay bills. We got, and that's yeah. what kind of what this podcast is about, or like my motivation behind it. So you do things that you don't necessarily love, but as long as you don't lose sight of ultimately like where you want to be, and then you get to a point with confidence in yourself where you're like, I don't care if if so and so thinks I'm <clears throat> like some people are gonna think I'm very far on the spectrum of being creative. Other people are going to think I'm a, a hack. I don't care because I know who I am and what I want to create. And I know the stories that I want to tell and, and the, the impact I want to make. And I'm just going to do that. And, and um, you know, I guess I listen to people's feedback, but I'm also like, you know what? I'm going to leave my job in the middle of coronavirus. You know, right, it, it right, might not right. make sense to you, but like I have a vision for what I want. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And I think, you know, yeah. Like what you're saying with the Maslow like thing is like, you know, everything that I am saying, and I assume a lot of what you're saying as well is like, there's a caveat of, th there's a level of pragmatism that's important. Like you, you need to feed yourself. You need to feed maybe your family, you need to pay your bills, et cetera. So, you know, keep all those things in mind, and that's, you know, that's another societal or situational systemic problem or, mm -hmm. or challenge to be overcome and to be worked around and figured out and leveraged in the ways that fulfill you. But yeah, those, those things exist as well. And I'm saying like, you, we need to know, you know, you need to settle into the ethic and the self-respect and the confidence that you have in your vision for your life and how you spend your time and your attentions and where you put those things um, within the framework of, yeah, you need to put food on the table. We live in a capitalist system. We like have bills to pay. We, you know, people will come and take things away from us if we're late on bills, et cetera. So, you know, do those things, but you know, it takes like little habits, you know, it takes the right routines and the right habits and discipline and, I guess having like, you know, one, five, 10 year plans and all that stuff, like to keep yourself, you know, in check and on schedule for the life you're trying to architect, right? What are your five and 10 year plans? Ah, I, I, I'm not very good at this. I actually did. I did one of these recently um, for the first time. And, you know, I'll just think of, of some of the bullet points which were, um, I wanted to be, I wanted to be able to 
produce music and writing yearly in a way that paid my bills, um, whether that was through journalism, through, you know, any number of things. I always imagine myself, I, I imagine that I will be a, a magpie and a sort of like a person who takes little bits of everything through every genre and whatnot and just like makes things impulsively on a, on a weekly basis forever, you know, like whether it's like music or videos or, you know, I did a daily comic for three years on Instagram, like, and, and it's just a matter of like, yeah, Doug's. Yeah. Uh, and like all these things, like, so, you know, creating regularly and, and, selling that stuff in a way or yeah, giving that to people in a way that I can support myself. Um, meditation retreats was a regular thing that Hmm. I, I, I hoped I would get be, be doing more in the next five, 10 years, uh, writing writers retreats as well. A lot of it had to do with being isolated and traveling, (laughs) but like all through the lens of creating and sharing, uh, my, my work or whatever. Um, and just seeing more of the world, um, you know, through journalism as well. Um, whether that's podcasting or, or, you know, written print journalism. Um, but all of that, you know, boils down to, I want to be able to support myself through what I make and I don't want to spend my time like, bringing food to people's houses or whatever, like, or, or putting things on shelves or, you know, hammering and and screwing things together unless I want to. And (laughs) unless maybe that helps someone in a way that I care about, you know, but um, yeah, I've just, so, so like the, the five and 10 year plan, you know, in the law, in in a general way has to do with that. Um, And uh, website building and, creating a community, maybe a Patreon. Um, those are some avenues through which I can definitely achieve that kind of community and a uh, forum through which to share this stuff. Um, but yeah, it's important to know like what you want out of life. And like you're like you said, like to, to not know, to be confused about your ethics or intentions because you're so mired in everyone else's opinion of you and what you do, or if, if, if not what they're saying now, your anxiety about what they will say when you make your choices out loud, you know, that stuff that can really obscure your identity and obscure your intentions, I think. So the quicker you can get out of that headspace and be confident in your desires and your choices and your identity, the better, I think. So, you know, find my advice for that is like surround yourself with the people that understand you as you authentically and what you do and persistently encourage that and, and reward that, uh, and keep you on your path as opposed to people that you feel like you have to take a, an unwanted break or an unnecessary step away from your journey in order to meet them where they are, you know, um, if you feel like you can't be your authentic self around someone or around a group of people, then maybe they're just kind of existing as a distraction and maybe you've outgrown them. Um, for some people, you can't step away from those people and you might not want to, and you might not need to, you know, not to be a purist about it and not to say like everyone has to service you or a path or otherwise they can go. <laughs> um, but I think it definitely helps to be sure that you are surrounded by people that will help you get to where you want to be and who you want to be, you know? Supportive and hopefully like-minded. Yeah. Yeah. And, and ideally more talented than you sure yeah more or more knowledgeable you know that you have no you can it's it's probably it feels most gratifying and and for your ego to be the best and the smartest in the room but you have the least to learn there yep i love it i mean that could be from being around musicians or being around other skateboarders you know you're gonna level up if you're around people that are 
Yeah. Or business people or whatever it is, you know? Yep. Like, so want to grow. let's talk to a 17 year old, 18 year old baby Bruce, baby Tyler, oh. like somebody that's maybe interested in being a full-time artist or a musician or a creative person. Um, would you recommend they're about to graduate high school? Would you recommend moving somewhere in particular? Would you recommend going to a particular college or to a particular program? Would you recommend not doing those kind of things? Now that you've kind of gone through, I know you didn't really like Oswego, uh, the college that we where we met, and yeah. so you left. But now you're back in school, so you obviously don't hate education as an is like as a institution altogether so kind of give me like now that you've done it what would you advise younger people to do um well if you're sure you know what you want to do or you really you you know what you want to do for yourself like let's just assume that that's where your head is right like you you've already gotten through that whole difficult thing chances are that's going to change. But like, I, I guess the way you identify that really quickly, I'll just say like, what is it you feel most alive doing? What is it that makes you feel like electrified and excited when you're doing it? Uh, what is the thing that like, when you complete it, you are most excited to show other people or you feel most um, like grateful for having spent time on? Or what's the thing that lets you forget about time and forget about everything except the thing you're doing what gets you in your flow state whatever that thing is probably your acumen you know some people are lucky to have many many things that that trigger that headspace um but some people most people i think just have like one or two and and if you know whatever your acumen is whatever you have a proclivity for i think like you should probably pursue doing that thing um because you're going to serve yourself and others best by doing that. And you'll probably enjoy your times the more you do that. Um, so once that's out of the way, um, I would, the moving places thing, you know, I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe if, maybe if there's a specific place that is ideal for that, like, you know, a ton of filmmakers flock to whatever LA, you know, uh, or, or like a lot of artists and musicians like go to Brooklyn or go to New York or Nashville um, you know, where do podcasters go? Their room? The mm, <laughs> I don't know if there is a hub. There's a lot of podcasters. Yeah, I mean, there, I guess by design, it's not necessary. There's no right. like geographic location. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, maybe, maybe that's ideal, you know, like to be entrenched in the business, right? Um, to, like if you're a comedian or whatever, like, okay, I need to go to these, you know, I need to go to the Chicago theater and be join it, join an improv group or whatever. And and that goes back to like that kind of migration that goes back to the idea of you need to be in the environment that is going to foster like the oasis or the paradise for the thing that you're trying to do. Cause you'll be around all the people that will instruct you both in the business and the meta sense and the mentality of it, but also like the skill sets that you need. So whatever it is, like just find, find that group of people, whatever it is for some people, for some musicians or whatever, it's going to be, go to your local open mic, your local dive bar, your local cafe, whatever. Um, so just find that, whatever that is, if you have to move, maybe you should move. Uh, I can't tell you that. I can't what town you are you living in now? I live in Smithtown, uh, on Long Island still. Um, is there a community uh, of, uh, people? uh, yeah, there's like a big, there's a big artist community out here and we're like an hour and a half. Um, from from new york city so you know there's also that you know um but yeah the the two counties out on the island there's a ton of uh creative people and there's a lot of there's a big like bohemian underground scene um of musicians and artists and writers and everything so uh there's a lot of that community to tap into that i've found um that i've collaborated with over the years um but so Formal education is the next part I was wondering Formal about. education. Um, I mean, honestly, for me at this point, I, I feel systematically formal education is a ruse and it's, it's a grift. <laughs> um, 
I mean, I know I'm going right now. Um, it's, it was because I don't have a bachelor's. I'm to be, you know, I'm to be transparent. Like I'm 32. I, I was thinking about, you know, that pragmatic stuff. Um, and I was like, you know, I don't have a bachelor's yet. I want to learn something. And again, all the reasons why I said I was interested in journalism came to mind. And we have an amazing journalism school in the local uh, SUNY college, Stony Brook. Um, so, which is like a really great college around around the country, I guess, uh, mostly for doctors and stuff. But they have a great journalism school, I found out. So I decided to pursue that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I it, it continues or has only gotten worse. Like the things that caused me to drop out of school when you met me. Um, I am not an academic type person. I don't do well in academia. Like I'm an intelligent person and I'm driven when I want to be, but like because of issues like ADHD or because of my own like stubbornness and, and allure to my own projects and talent, like I don't do well in school generally. And it takes an awful lot of effort for me to do well. Um, and it takes a lot of discipline that I, <laughs> on a daily basis, frustrate it frustrates me and, and I have trouble with, but this is uh, something I've decided to try to do. So uh, I'm going for it and I'm, I'm doing it. But, you know, if, if school is not for you, that you're, you're one of many. And, and I think most people will say like, they're like, especially with COVID, maybe it's, it's a little easier. Like if you get an online degree, that's, that's broadening now. Um, but I think, if you're trying to, unless you're trying to do something that the school itself will teach you something or put you in an environment where you will meet, you know, whatever it is, fellow engineers or fellow uh, artists, fellow musicians or whatever, like, I think school is just like a way that you're just going to get really in debt. You're never going to be able to like get yourself off the ground uh, because you're going to be entrenched in, in the, the school debt. Uh, I think the biggest part about it is the environment that you're in when you're in school, you're surrounded by hopefully like-minded people who are all ambitious and trying to do something, you know, like all the, the enduring things I got out of Oswego were, were you and the group of friends we were with and collaborating with those people and spending time with those people and those lessons. But otherwise, you know, everything, most everything else was nonsense. And, and, and most of your career is going to be, on the job training, granted, there's a thing, the college premium, right? So it's like, you're as an, a potential employee, you're people only care about you if you have a bachelor's or above, and that like will only continue to raise. And so this is why, you know, we don't have to get into it, but like that, that's why like colleges are, are so gutsy in charging so much because they know you don't have a choice culturally. <laughs> um, and they kind of like stiff arm you into these debts, uh, which, you know, the, these companies are happy to loan to you. But, you know, I can't say what you should or shouldn't do with this, but from, from my eye and from everything I've read and heard essentially, and from all the lives I've seen, you know, of people our age, generally, especially if you're going to go on to be an entrepreneur anyway, you don't need a degree. You need the skills. And why do people go to college? Ideally in the abstract of what college is to get those skills. So if you can like, I don't think education's bad. I think like that system is bad. So if you sign up for an Adobe or like a, a pro, an Adobe Photoshop class online or like a master class for Pro Tools engineering or for video, then I think you should work your ass off for that, but only do it for the skills and the knowledge and the jobs, right? And there's, you know, the the reason we go to the things you learn most when you're in college is during the internships where you're actually putting into practice the shit that you're doing. Like I only know what I know about performing and writing because of all of the performing and writing I've done. And because I've entrenched myself in reading and talked to many performers and watched many performances and studied it and studied it and studied it and tried and tried and tried and failed and failed and failed and, and learned and succeeded and like all of that just comes from practice. And there's that cliche of the Malcolm Gladwell 10,000 hours thing where like you just have to clock in every day, I think. 
And you have to educate yourself on your passions and your skills and the thing that you hope to turn into your career and study up, you know, like the, un, the, the stuff that's not fun is that like, you're going to end up, like you said earlier, you're going to end up working harder than you would if you just got a job, a normal job, <clears throat> if you are your own boss. Uh, so you're not just going to, um, you know, you're not just going to be the writer or the, the musician or the singer or the videographer. You're also going to be the guy who handles the business and the guy who writes the invoices and the guy who has to buy the equipment and, and the, the girl who has to like send their st short story to, you know, 200 uh, publishers who are going to reject it. And you have to endure the rejection and you have to be your own cheerleader and therapist during that. And so, <laughs> so, you know, think of all that as well. And if you think you can endure that or you'll, you want that path regardless of those struggles, then I think like you just have to do it. Like I joined an accountability group a couple months ago for artists online and, and I won't name any names and I won't say any more details than this, but essentially it was like a group that on the surface was a great thing. And it was a community of people. And the point was to, at, every, at the, the top of every month, get together online on like whatever it is, uh, Discord or something. Mm -hmm. I, I forget the format or whatever it was, but it was a streaming thing. Um, and it was to talk about what your goal for the month that was or whatever they were. And, you know, talk with other people and hear other people out about what their struggles are, what their intentions are. Maybe you offer your services and barter to like help people get to where they're trying to be with their craft or their business great idea. However, what it ended up being was a lot of people just complaining nebulously about why they can't do the thing they want to do. And like, whether it was personal issues or personal anxieties or difficulties with equipment or insecurities about their craft or whatever it was. And I think I'm noticing myself either get get older or less compassionate or just more pragmatic <laughs> because I, you know, I just found myself like thinking over and over again, just, just shut up and do the thing. You're your own barrier. Like the answer is you're in your own way. Uh -huh. either, either do it or don't acknowledge the issue and acknowledge what it is that's in your way and work around it. And that's your answer. And you just do it. And you know, it is, it, it really is just like, if you want it, you'll find a way to do it. Stop talking about it and just make it happen. And like talk about it enough to either get it off, get your emotional issues off your chest or, or find support or whatever it is. Like that's great and fine and important. I think that's, you know, that kind of stuff. I, I'm endlessly thankful for people in my life that have been there for that kind of talk I've given out and, and needed. But like at a certain point, you know, like you, you really just need to power through and, and get the work done because otherwise, it doesn't get done and you just have to be real with yourself that like, Oh, you know what? Maybe, maybe I feel better just complaining about it and talking as a dreamer, you know, like, Oh, I would love to do this and I really want to do this, et cetera, et cetera. But then never doing it. It's like, well, it's, it loses its import. It loses its, its value after a while because you're like, Oh, you just like to say the idea of being an artist or a productive creative person but you don't like to actually get your hands dirty. And, and those people you'll, you know, you'll find those people eventually. I'm sure, you know, there are certain people that come to you. There's certain people that like, you know, I, I see around the Island every, you know, when I go to open mics to practice new material or when I set up shows, you know, there's certain people that I bump into. Ball grabbers. Yeah, man. They're, yeah. Or they're just like, yo man, we got to collaborate, man. We got to do this. I, I've really been wanting to do this. I, I'm just trying to get my, my shit together for the studio. And I'm like, dude, I, you've been telling me this same conversation for 10 years. Like, I, I don't even hear you anymore. You know, like, I know that we're never going to do anything. I know you're never going to do the thing you say. Somehow, you have a blind spot to that. Unfortunately, it's depressing. That's like very sad. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's unfortunate. And I, I feel for people that whatever they, you know, I, trust me, I am way behind on what I want to do. I'm not where I want to be in my life yet. Um, I have not done as much as I set out to do yet. Um, I have, you know, left I've re as of right now, I'm like six months behind on a, on an album deadline. Um, so 
I, you know, I'm not saying that I'm this per, this paragon of productivity and and mental health and and uh, ambition, right? But like these are these are ethics that like I strive for because I know that they are efficacious, that they will get me where I hope to be, where I intend on being, you know? Um, so, so yeah, I, I would just say like, only go to school if you think it will serve your craft. Uh, <laughs> long, long answer to the short question. Typical of me. Uh, but yeah, I, I mean, it really comes down to just like find what you want and do that thing as much as you can around people that will encourage you and to improve your craft and do better at it and be smarter about the business side of it and the art side of it. And, and, and don't be like that guy. Don't wait. Don't wait till you're out of high school. Don't wait till you're out of college. No, don't wait till no. you get a better job. Don't you're just, always, yeah, no, there is no way. There is no, like, there's no perfect situation. You know, there's no, there's no time that it's smartest to do a thing. Like you're only, no matter what, no matter how successful you get, maybe, maybe not. Maybe if you're like hyper successful, you're like, oh yeah, everything happens for a reason. And it, you know, I'm just, it all fell into place. But like, I think that's probably a, a stupid way to think of it. But uh, you know, if, if you're generally, you're always going to think like, oh, I should have done that a week ago. Or like, I should have started that five years ago. You know, <laughs> like, and it's a daily thing. That's it. Like, you, the thing that, one of the things that stands by me or sticks with me the most was this idea that Tim Ferriss said, which was like, when setting out to do a new endeavor, the, the bet, one of the best ways to do it is to imagine how it would be easiest first. Mm, and lazy people that, work the hard or yeah, just like, I, I don't do remember the saying, but yeah, exactly. But yeah. Like just, just, uh, just do it the easiest way. And then, <laughs> then over time, you discover what you can change, but like you need the routine mm -hmm. first. You mm -hmm. need the like, Hey, once a week, I'm going to put out a video or, you know, what, you know, once a month, like I, I'm going to finish one short story every month or whatever. And then eventually maybe you get two out every month or, or four or whatever it is like, you know, but don't bite it, off too much. Yeah. It just, it's just because you're never, it's the same thing with like dieting the same thing with anything. Like it's the same thing with like, you, if you if you start skating trying to ollie a ten stair, you're just gonna like get scared, break your legs, and then think skating's not for you. <laughs> like what? Why would you choose that? <laughs> just like go pump around in the street every day, uh -huh. and you know everything else will build from there. So don't be unrealistic. Set your goals high, but don't be unrealistic with your expectations for yourself because you're just kind of like, you know, it's just like you're not gonna you're gonna get easily discouraged because it's like beyond what you're capable of. But, mm -hmm. like, I think you should always, I guess the other thing is like never, like once you feel complacent or comfortable, start moving around and trying new things that make you squirm, you know? Yeah, I live by that one for sure. Hey, we could talk for another hour. And in fact, I'd love to, at a different point, I'd love to have sure. you back on the show. Sure. Um, but uh, I want to uh, give you an opportunity to kind of let people know how they can find you or connect with you or learn from you. Uh, plug some stuff. What are you working on? Um, so you can find me on all social media, like Instagram, Twitter, um, everything is all one voice. That's all spelled out. Um, those are the handles for everything. YouTube forward slash all one voice. Um, all my music is available on all digital platforms. Um, but if you want to like support it most directly and download it or buy the merch and whatnot, it's all one voice dot bandcamp dot com. I have, as I said before, like lots of albums. I've been releasing music videos and singles um, since the pandemic started for an album I've been working on called Emotionauts uh, with the producer Conscious Robot. Um, and uh, actually, in like a week and a half, I'm filming another music video. Uh, so, you know, I'm constantly making things. Um, I have a mailing list. You can find a way on there. Um, if you're interested in like, spoken uh, or like bespoken or bespoke poems or or something for your loved ones or whatever you can email me that's all one voice at gmail.com and we could talk about collaboration or whatever it is um i'd be happy to do that but i'm always making something whether it's writing or music or poetry you know performance or video um and posting some photography or whatever it is and uh yeah i just in this world to connect with people and and learn and and love and figure things out and make things interesting. So if you're interested in that kind of thing, you can find me 
in those places. Thank you for listening. Thanks for coming on. So uh, in, in upcoming episodes of The Creative Truth, I'm going to be talking to other artists, entrepreneurs, and creative professionals to kind of help discover their path to success. So if you're watching this on YouTube, please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And if you're listening, please leave us a good review on your favorite podcast platform. You can send questions for Bruce. Uh, you can drop them as comments below, or you can send uh, questions, suggestions for guests or episode feedback to wecreatetruth at gmail.com. And you can visit us online at creative-truth.com to learn more. So to close out today's episode, Bruce is going to actually premiere uh, one of his tracks off of Emotionauts. So tell us a little bit about what we're about to hear. So yeah, this is a song called Anodyne as Oblivion. Uh, it's the first, it's the fourth single from the album and the first music video for it. And it was produced by Conscious Robot. And my friends, Andrew and Johnny and I made the video in my basement with a lot of mirrors and some, some black tablecloths. And it's just to go to show that like, you can do anything on a budget. And um, I think it came out great. And the song is super vulnerable for me and I'm really happy with it. So I hope it connects with you. I always look nervous in an ATM mirror. Only stage fright in this day to day theater. Pay my bills during holiday months Love my family, but candidly I don't really talk to them much I'm horribly disorganized Sort of blinded by my starry eyes Talkative but often shy I'm always sorry, I apologize I'm awkward and I'm thoughtful And I'm nauseously agreeable Gregarious but happiest around people who don't need me to Throw dry as hell, cry for help On a mic I yell and scream into Stubborn to gulp in the water you would lead me to. I'm flaky, reminded of psoriasis, hating my own skin since I was six. Lately, I've got zip in my pockets, but shaky hands and dryer lint, draining tired pen, riddled my mole skin, zany psychoglyphs, scribbled my two cents. I invest in costly contemplation. I confront my fears, but my fear is confrontation. Catalog these privileges, sabotaged by his dizziness. Rabbit dog in the wilderness, chatter is Ali Finnegan, manic as Robin Williams, tragically robbed the world in his hands. Not in the wheel of wreck, panic raws my wedding list. Spastic, he's sobbing, wilted, and catatonic, he's still in bed, camouflaging an invalid, catastrophically sinking, and mad at his loss of innocence. Can't absolve what he didn't fix. Stranded on island, Gilligan, gasping, cut losses, kills again, flailing in water, missing fits. Trapped in the thought of sick or swim. Family taught he is a fish, having ignored his wing again. Frantically in an Iliad fantasy, my Achilles went fancy himself as brilliant. Frankly, I am an idiot. Half the time I'm oblivious. Anodyne is oblivion. Pantymom is a simpleton. Pantomiming is slitting wrist. Drastically caught him giving and had a dime to his will, I guess. Had to dine in his gilded dish. Snacking pride has been killing him. I always look weird like a carnival mirror I wear a mustache so my bobby feels nearer Living in the shadow though their warmth is my sun But the artistry but honestly was hurt less by stars My passion is undeniable, reliably unreliable My discipline is pliable and often I'll do the unadvisable My need for a shrink is sizable Liable to indict what's undiagnosed Lying to himself, selling some kind of bull Like that's a viable sign of growth Emotional when I'm low enough I wanna go and jump off something high Although I'm not when I'm broken up I feel alone and dumb and blind My throat and nuts, I choke and sob I hope I'm high